Hi there, my name is Peter Badu and I work in the Department of Mathematics at MIT. And today I'm going to share with you our recent work on physics-informed dynamic mode decomposition. And this is a collaborative project between myself, Nathan Coates and Steve Brunton at the University of Washington, Beverly McKeon at Caltech and Benjamin Herman at the University of Chile. And this project was focused on extending the dynamic mode decomposition to situations where we have prior physical knowledge about the system we're studying. So I'm going to begin with an introduction, a reminder of what DMD is, what dynamic mode decomposition is. And in recent years, it's become one of the leading algorithms for data-driven system identification. So DMD has three main steps. And like in any machine learning or data-driven algorithm, the first step is the collection and organization of data. So DMD works with data that is arranged in a specific way. It works with data that consists of snapshots of a system at different points in time. So in this case, the system at hand is the flow past a cylinder, and the snapshots are of vorticity measurements at each point uh, on this spatial grid. So these X vectors are going to be very, very tall vectors. They're going to have tens or hundreds of thousands or more uh, entries. And we're going to take a few snapshots, a few pictures of this system at a few points in time. So you see I have M snapshots in this case. So we're going to take these M snapshots, we're going to arrange them into two matrices, an X matrix and a Y matrix. And the columns of these matrices are just the snapshots at different times, and they're arranged sequentially in order. And the difference between the Y and the X matrix is simply that the columns of the Y matrix are the columns of the X matrix, but just shifted to the left. Uh, in other words, the columns of the Y matrix are the elements of the X matrix, but advance forward one time step. Uh, DMD seeks to model the data that we've generated, that, that we've collected, as if it were generated by a linear dynamical system. So mathematically, we assume that the data satisfies this type of relation, that there is a matrix A such that um, for each XK, um, we can represent the measurement advance forward one time step as, as if we'd hit XK with that matrix A. And we don't know A, we want to find it as part of the problem. So to do that, you can set up this optimization problem where we're trying to find an A that minimizes the difference between Y and AX. So this is just like saying I want to find an A, an a that um, gives as good predictions as I possibly can. It maps the XK as close as it possibly can onto the XK plus one uh, in the, the L2 sense. So this, uh, this norm here, um, it, the little f, is the Frobenius norm. And as such, we can solve this problem because it's just a, a least squares problem. So you can write down the solution analytically. It's just that a is um, y times the more Penrose pseudo inverse of x. Although in practice, those solutions, are, uh, the matrices are extremely large. So we don't want to actually construct this explicitly. We want to look at a low dimensional version of this problem, uh, of this operator. So to do that, we project the matrix A onto a low dimensional subspace. Here I'm projecting onto the first R principal components. And now we have that matrix, that linear operator in a tractable low dimensional space. We can do various diagnostic tests on it. And by far the most popular ones to do are to look at the so-called dynamic modes. So those are the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of that matrix A. So the modes are the spatial modes, they are just the eigenvectors of that matrix, and the time dynamics are the corresponding eigenvalues. Because remember, this A is representing a linear dynamical system. So we could break up this data, we could decompose it just into um, a linear combination of these spatial modes with time dynamics corresponding to the corresponding eigenvalues. Okay. And one really cool thing about DMD is that it's completely equation-free. So there was no point in this process that I told the algorithm that we were studying a fluid mechanics system or that we um, knew that this was an incompressible flow. And as such, the algorithm has been applied to a huge variety of application areas, some of which have uh, nothing really obvious to do with each other. So there's great applicability of DMD. But one could say that that might be indicative of a lost opportunity. There was no opportunity here to include our physical knowledge about the system. There was no opportunity to include any conservation laws, any invariances, or any symmetries that we might know after having done centuries worth of physics work to understand fluid mechanics. So we set to address that 
in this work, we asked the question, how can we include that, fire, that prior physical knowledge into DMD? And this physics-informed DMD is what we came up with. So to come up with physics-informed DM, physics DMD, we had to go back and look at the original DMD algorithm and try and reformat it in a way that allows physics to be seamless, seamlessly integrated therein. So one way of looking at DMD is that it seeks a low-rank matrix that best represents the data. So this point goes back to the comment I made in passing that usually we project the matrix A onto a low-dimensional subspace. So another way of thinking about that is that uh, DMD is approximately solving this minimization problem. Given a specific target rank R, it seeks a rank R or less matrix A that best maps X onto Y, that best advances the data forward in time. This is approximately what the regression step of DMD is doing. And one way of thinking about these low-rank matrices is that they can be factorized into these, these two parts, um, into a, a set of R columns and a set of R rows. And this is representative of modal physics. So if I'm studying a modal system, a system where there's just a few dominant modes that characterize the behavior of the system, then I just need to understand those modes. Analogously, if I'm looking at a low-rank matrix, I don't need to understand like, every single element in this matrix. I just need to understand these two columns and these two rows. And low-rank matrices have additional computational properties, which make them really attractive. Like They're very efficient to work with in, in terms of memory, and you can do fast computations. And as such, they've really dominated a lot of the DMD literature and the model order reduction literature as well. But low-rank matrices aren't the only type of interesting or useful matrix structure out there. There's a whole world of different matrices that might be uh, more relevant or more useful for your um, physical application. For example, we might be studying a quantum mechanical system, and we know that the observable we're working with is Hermitian um, or self-adjoint. Then we might seek a symmetric matrix um, as opposed to a low-rank matrix. Or we might be studying a, a causal system, some, some system that has some spatial hierarchy. Then a low-rank matrix, matrix might not be the best choice. We might actually be more interested in a causal matrix that has a sort of upper triangular structure. So we don't want to be tied to a low-rank representation. We want to have the flexibility to include additional physics um, with additional matrix structures. So that's how we include this uh, physical knowledge into DMD. We, uh, we don't necessarily constrain the matrix to have uh, a low rank. We instead constrain it to lie in what we call a matrix manifold, a physics-informed matrix manifold. So that's just a fancy way of saying um, we require the matrix A to be a certain type of matrix, like I mentioned before, a, a symmetric matrix or an upper triangular matrix. And that choice of manifold, that the choice of class of matrix, um, should be informed by our physical prior knowledge of the system. So you can um, actually solve many of these problems uh, in closed form, by which I mean just in terms of standard linear algebra objects like an SVD or a polar decomposition or a QR decomposition. So all of these different matrix structures you can solve for just using these standard, very simple linear algebra operations. And um, on this slide, I've illustrated the physical um, structure, like self-adjointness, the corresponding matrix structure, and where you can find the solution of that, that optimization problem that I showed on the previous slide. <clears throat> so you can see that in a few places, the solutions are new. So we've generated new uh, solutions to these optimization problems. But this uh, physics-informed optimization problem is actually um, pretty old. It goes back um, very far, um, actually all the way to Greek mythology. Um, there was a famous character called Procrustes in Greek mythology, and he was a bandit who lived on a road um, in Greece, and he would invite weary travelers into his home, and he would tell them that he had a magical bed, and no matter what size they were, they would fit on the bed. And the travelers were really excited by this because it sounded like they were going to get a great night's sleep on this perfect fitting bed. Um, but what they realized was that when they went to Procrustes' home is that the reason they would fit on the bed is that he would either 
amputate their limbs or elongate them so that they stretched on to the bed. And I'm not just telling this story for fun, but uh, actually the optimization problem I showed previously is um, often called a Procrustes problem. The reason being that every term in this optimization has a corresponding role in this legend. So we could say that the victim is the matrix X, the bed is the matrix Y, this is the so-called magical bed, and then the treatment is the matrix A. So Procrustes is trying to find the treatment that best maps the matrix X onto the matrix Y, the treatment that best maps the victim onto the bed. Okay, and these have been studied um, quite a lot in the statistical literature, so there were a few prior solutions that we could draw on in this project. And the link between Procrustes and DMD is a novel connection, and it allows us to leverage a large amount of extant literature into the Procrustes problems for these new DMD applications. Okay. So one of the most basic physical principles is that of conserved quantities, and one of the most basic principles therein is that of energy conservation. So it seems very natural that we should seek a version of DMD that preserves the energy of the state. It doesn't allow energy to, to grow or to dissipate. So in terms of mathematics, we might seek a matrix A that preserves the energy of the state. So if this E corresponds to the energy of the state, then we want the energy of XK to be the same as the energy of A of XK. And it's pretty common to model the energy as just the L2 norm of the state, so that the energy is just the 2 norm um, squared of the, the state that we're working with here. So if you want the energy to preserve, then this equation has to hold. And if it holds for all such xk, then that's equivalent to saying that this matrix A is, is unitary. It has eigenvalues lying on the unit circle, and it has orthogonal um, columns and rows. That's like geometrically saying that the model has, uh, is either a reflection or a rotation. So the Procrustes problem, this is actually the original Procrustes problem, um, it takes this form. We're trying to find a unitary A, an A that satisfies this identity, that minimizes the difference between Y and A of X. And it turns out that you can write down the solution for that just in terms of an SVD. So we can write down the exact solution for this optimization problem. Let's go now and apply that solution to a physical problem. So here we're working with the, the double pendulum, which is a nonlinear problem. And we're working um, with relatively small amplitude uh, perturbations, so it's approximately linear. And in the absence of any friction or air resistance, this system preserves energy. And the energy is the combination of the um, gravitational potential energy and the kinetic energy. So we know. Um, that this system uh, has a conserved quantity, it has uh, conserved energy. And we're going to apply DMD and physics-informed DMD to this system. Uh, but there are two hiccups. The first is that we're going to take noisy measurements of this system. So I'm going to measure the thetas, like the angles of the red and the orange bars. And I'm going to add some Gaussian noise to them. Uh, there's another source of noise, which is modeling noise. We're modeling this nonlinear system as a linear system. So there's going to be um, some unmodeled terms in our model. And the result you can see down here is that if we train a PyDMD model and a DMD model and try and reconstruct the data, well, DMD does very poorly because its eigenvalues end up being artificially smaller than they should be. Um, whereas physics-informed DMD is constrained to have eigenvalues on that unit circle. It's a, it's a unitary operator. Its eigenvalues have to have um, absolute value 1. Uh, and as a result, um, you can see that it, uh, it doesn't let energy just go to zero, but it preserves the energy and it obtains a really excellent reconstruction here. So the poor performance of DMD is um, very well documented in the presence of noise, and there are various algorithms to address that. And this is another, another method you could use that includes the physical knowledge as a regularizer that can alleviate the effects of noise. Okay. Another very common physical property is shift invariance. And by shift invariance, we mean that the system we're studying looks the same no matter how we translate our view of the system. So such systems are common in uh, constant coefficient PDEs and convolutional integral equations. Another way of thinking about these is that um, the operator or the system should commute with the shift operator. So the shift operator takes in um, functions, and it just shifts their arguments. 
If our system is shift invariant, then it should commute with that shift operator. In other words, shifting the input is the same as shifting the output. If we translate that mathematical statement into the matrix world, then we'd see that the, the matrix A that satisfies this relation is um, circulant. It has constant da diagonals uh, with periodicity. So if we want to tackle a DMD problem where we know that the operator should be shift invariant, then we can set up this problem where we have the same cost function except now A is required to have this circulant structure. This optimization problem is actually uh, pretty easy to solve. There's just three facts that we need to employ. The first fact is that circulant matrices are diagonalizable by the DFT matrices. So that means that we can write this matrix A um, in diagonal form where the, the left and right vectors are the, the discrete Fourier transform matrix. So this is just saying that eigenve eigenvectors of shift invariant systems um, are just sines and cosines. That's all this relation says. And then we can plug in this representation for A, and now our task is to find this little a, little a hat, which are the eigenvector, eigenvalues of the system. Um, so we've simplified the problem a bit. The next thing to notice is that the DFT matrix is unitary. And since the Frobenius norm is, in, is unitarily invariant, I can move this F star from this term to this term and get rid of the star. That's just uh, by hitting that whole, whole um, expression with an F. So now I've got this problem, and now I can actually break this problem into its constituent parts, by which I mean we can decouple this Frobenius norm via its rows. So the Frobenius norm, you, you often see it as the sum of the L2 of the columns. It's also the sum of the L2 norm of the rows, and uh, that's what we do here. And now we just have a one-dimensional regression problem. We, we've decoupled all of these AIs. We just want to find an AI that best maps f of y uh, best maps f of x onto f of y. So you can write that solution as just a linear regression. Here I've, I've written the sort of MATLAB uh, backslash notation, but you can also write that in terms of the pseudo inverse or the, uh, the transpose of fx and so on. We can apply this shift invariant principle to some pretty complicated examples like the three dimensional Navier Stokes equations. So in this case, um, we're looking at a realistic initial condition that could be realized uh, in experiments. And we're seeing how it propagates um, with this parabolic background flow. So this is Poisson flow. It's a very, pretty high state dimension with about 200,000 elements uh, in each state vector. And we only have 300 temporal snapshots. So I'm only looking at this and taking pictures of it at 300 different points in time. So it's a very underdetermined system. We can apply DMD to this and seek a DMD model which would necessarily be low rank. It would have to have this this structure where we're separating A into its modal constituents. That would be quite difficult because the Navier-Stokes equations have this uh, convective term which is quite difficult for DMD and these low rank representations to capture. But we know something about the system. Just by looking at it, we can see that there's a certain spatial structure. There's homogeneity in two directions, um, in the x and the z direction. Um, there isn't homogeneity in the y direction because of this um, parabolic background flow. But if we know this physics, we can then encode that using the ideas from the previous slide into, the, into a pi DMD model. So now we're not just seeking a low rank A, but we're seeking an A that respects that shift invariance. So we've done that by uh, encoding A to have um, circulant blocks um, on, on two levels. And if we do that, then you can see that the eigenvalues learned by pi DMD are much more accurate than those le learned by standard DMD. Um, specifically, the least damped eigenvalues, which are really the most important ones, are obtained uh, very accurately, whereas standard DMD doesn't really learn any of them. Okay. Something else that we can include with this physics-informed perspective is spatial locality. So spatial locality just means that states that are spatially local to one another, that are near to one another, are more closely coupled than states that are far apart from one another. So that's a hallmark of partial differential equations, where the, the, the rate of change of the state is a function of derivatives of the state. Uh, it's not a, a hallmark of, say, integral systems, where you are integrating your system over a, a spatial domain. So this uh, is a good example of a spatially local problem where we have a, um, an advection diffusion term with a spatially variable uh, advection term there. 
and you can see a bit how this evolves. Um, this is in the absence of forcing, so the F term is zero. And we're going to attack this problem with uh, DMD, with a standard DMD method and then our physics-informed DMD. But we're going to enforce spatial locality in the physics-informed DMD model. And specifically, you can see here, that means we're going to let the um, pi DMD model only be um, tridiagonal. That means the state can only be affected by states adjacent to it. Okay. You can see what happens if we do that. The model learned by DMD has this low rank structure. The model learned by pi DMD is constrained to have this tridiagonal structure. Um, the ensuing resolvent norms and response modes and forcing modes are, are therefore much more accurate. You can see that the um, response modes here are very well captured. So the yellow is the pi DMD and the gray is the ground truth and also for the, these resolvent norms. I should mention that, that these quantities, the resolvent more norms, and these modes are representations of um, the, the optimal forcing function f in the frequency domain. So if you wanted to cause a, 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 as large a possible perturbation to your state c, then you should choose one of these uh, response modes, uh, sorry, one of these forcing modes to produce a response mode of, uh, of a norm of a magnitude that corresponds to these curves. So this is, uh, this is resolvent analysis, specifically data-driven resolvent analysis. Another way of thinking about this is that we're basically doing a data-driven finite difference method. Instead of applying a finite difference matrix, we're trying to learn the best finite difference matrix that represents the data. Okay. So here's a brief summary of all the systems that we've studied using this physics-informed DMD. Uh, there's a few different types of physical systems, uh, including quantum mechanics, fluid dynamics, um, even a neural, um, a, a, a neuron equation here. Um, there's a lot of information here, so I'll just draw your attention to these red columns. And the point is that physics-informed DMD is much better able to identify the eigenvalues of the system if we tell it um, something about the physics of the underlying system. So I'll wrap up here. I presented this physics-informed DMD algorithm, which is a new method of seamlessly integrating prior physical knowledge into the DMD framework. And it does so by enforcing the learned DMD model to lie in a specific matrix manifold. Um, once we've calculated that, that matrix, we can then look at its diagnostic properties, such as its dynamic modes, or its spectrum, or its uh, resolvent modes. Through a sequence of examples, we've shown that the models learned by, D by Pi DMD have greater generalization power. Um, they're less sensitive to noise, and they require fewer training samples. And one big reason for that is that uh, we're effectively telling DMD something about data that it hasn't observed. When we're telling the system that it's shift invariant, or we're telling it that it's, um, it preserves energy, we're giving it additional information so that it can generalize more powerfully. And these Pi DMD models usually have fewer degrees of freedom than standard DMD models, so that's why they require fewer training samples. Additionally, we've derived um, what we call exact solutions, just meaning that the solutions are in terms of standard linear algebra objects, and these are all available um, on a GitHub, and the paper is also available on archive, so I invite you to go and read it there. Thank you for listening. Please get in touch if you have any questions about anything.